<laughs> Hello, everybody. How are you doing? A bit windy, isn't it? It's uh, uh, six on the scale of Beaufort, so that's uh, pretty stiff. Um, we'll, uh, I'll keep it brief. We'll have a very interesting presentation, uh, as it looks like right now. Attitude and Action at KPN, incumbent provider in the Netherlands. You already know that. And J.A. Ballou has uh, recently been appointed uh, Chief Information Security Officer, so we'll hear all the goodies. Yes. If I look out in the audience, I only see friends. So that means like, you know, thank you for coming. So is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. So um, is that me? I don't know if that's me. Is that me? It probably is me. So um, really what I want to talk about today is what's happened, why are we here, what's different from the KPN you knew or you thought you knew to what we think we're doing today. So I just wanted to talk about that. So why are we here? It's basically because KPN uh, got quite hacked last year. There was several events. You know, it started really with DigiNotar in December, and then uh, there were problems with the KPN application that was used by their users. Um, with privacy issues, there was an investigation by the Telecommunications Regulatory Authority on KPN. Um, when KPN was trying to rectify the issues that were occurring during the hack, they actually sent the new uh, passwords and email addresses in the same physical letter back to their users, which was... Oh. Okay, which was unhandy in the least. I'm just going to go on because I don't want to eat into the next speaker's time. So the point being that there were quite a few issues at KPN. Um, and, you know, they were doing security. So they were doing things around their networks and, and basic security. But I think what, what happens in a lot of organizations today is that security, especially information security, tends to go forward, thank you, in, in a relatively old-fashioned way. So information security gets done with, you know, a guy that sits there and makes policies and then goes around the organization and says, this is the policy. So please conform to the policy unless, unless you have a business reason not to. And then you've got to tell me why you're going to exclude yourself from the policy and then go ahead. Because the business has evaluated the risk somewhere, found it better to accept that risk and carry on with their business than to conform to the security policy. How many of you guys recognize that? All right. So, not unusual. You know, KPN was not the only company that was doing stuff like that. The problem with that, though, is that you have a business of layers. The CEO isn't the dude that's accepting the business risk. Who accepts it at your company? Anybody who raises their hands, who accepts that business risk at your company? The engineers. Anyone else? The what? Management. Manage well, okay, that's unusual, actually, because usually it's like somewhere in the management chain. There might be a manager that says, too expensive, not interested, no time, other priority, blah. But what, what the point of that is, is that risk acceptance happens really low in that chain, in the food chain. So that means the top management has no clue they've uh, had this risk acceptance happen. They don't know about the actual danger. And then you have shit like this. By the way, does anyone object to profanity? Because there's going to be a lot of it in this talk. All right. All right. So the next shitty thing that they had was this. How many of you guys heard about the baby dump stuff? All right. It wasn't their fault. They didn't do baby dump, but because the users had used the same password and username combination on their KPN addresses as they used at baby dump, it just went over. And KPN, because they were already like poof, poof, with all the other stuff that happened, went out there and said, oh, mea culpa, our fault. OK, uh, what do we do? Oh, let me see. Maybe we should shut down the mail servers to protect our customers. And what is that? You know that I think we're going to have a hurricane. I won't get offended if you leave, if the tent blows away. So just so you know, I'm OK with that. Um, but what happened was, you know, with this, with this issue, does anybody not know about the baby dump issue? OK, I'm just going to quickly tell you. Baby dump 
It sounds like a place where you dump babies. That's <laughs> not what it is, although it deceivingly looks like that. It's actually a place where you buy, like, I don't know, rompers and, you know, like little onesies and outfits and baby room stuff, but it's a dump room prices, so it's supposed to be like a really cheap way to get stuff for your baby. So b the customers of Baby Dump were using passwords. This password file got on the internet, and we didn't know because it looked like it could be coming from us, and because we're so used to taking the blame for stuff that wasn't our fault, that was, that's what happened. So that's the Baby Dump story in a nutshell. Uh, by the way, have you guys ever heard other CISOs talk like I do about this? Just curious. Because that's got to change in general. We've got to be more transparent and open. But what happened here was um, the baby dump issue was one more of those issues that led to a culmination of events where we saw all of these hacks happening. And we saw them happening in general by people. By the way, if you don't read Dutch, it says, I will not hack the KPN anymore. Because we were having such a plethora of hacks, you know, and there were so many people. And finally, what turned out, the first hack that we had, the really big one, it was done by a 17-year-old kid who had absolutely no real malice intended, but was just poking around, looking for what he could find, stumbled on the KPN stuff, thought, like, cool, got root, and then went on and managed to get it published, and then big brouhaha later. Yeah? And the thing was, I thought it was really cool, like, as an outsider, to see what KPN was doing at the time, because they didn't, you know, sue for damages, et cetera. The legal proceedings had its thing, and then KPN said, right, we, we recognize what happened here. This is not how we would have liked it to happen, but that's it. We let it rest. Um, so all those actions culminated them in them realizing, okay, we need to maybe take a look at what we do with security and maybe see if there's another way to do it. Because you keep doing the same thing, you know, the same old-fashioned security policies, and then put them out in the organization, and then accepting risk. Maybe that's not the way to do it anymore. So um, I got hired, and that is not my real business card. Oh, it's gone again. OK. All right. It makes it more interesting, all this drama with the hurricane and projector. KPN security isn't in Zwolle at the moment. So, all right. So, um, so when we came on board, we came up with a plan about what exactly it is we wanted to do. So our mission statement is really very simple. It's to keep KPN reliable and secure and trusted, which is the most important thing we can do, by customers, partners, and society. That's a pretty simple mission. But how are we going to do that? Well, we got to do secure products and services. So all the products and services that we deliver, all of them, security is not optional. And high quality requirements for security are not optional. So what we're actually going to do is the standard stuff, right? So we've got that security framework stuff, which you've got to do, right? And then you've got to maintain processes, blah, blah. And then you have to make sure you do this with threats defined. And you've got to measure stuff remediate stuff. Sound familiar? Yeah. And then you've got to make sure that you've got the right folks in the right places to actually do something about the stuff that you measure, manage, remediate, etc. But what it really means is really just three things. Okay, so forget about everything that sounds familiar. If you break it down, it's just about three things. Make sure that you know, yeah, why people should not fuck up. Why should you not fuck up? Please, don't fuck up for the following reasons. Then, when you've maintained like that attitude that everybody realizes what happens if they fuck up, then you can say, all right, I'm going to now look, are they fucking up? So I'm going to have some clue about what's going on on my network. I'm going to make sure that I'm looking for things. And I'm going to keep like looking for intelligence on there that actually points to what's the risk that I'm running. And then finally, I have to build out my security capability so when I've told them something and I'm looking to make sure that they're following it, that finally I have some capability to actually fix it and do something about it. And preferably, yep. That's a time bomb. and. Oh, can, actually, no, that doesn't mean that. Um, so, you, well, can, 
What it means that we do normal uh, network security inspection that you normally need. So whatever firewalls do by themselves, they do. Whatever routers do by themselves, whatever IDS devices do by themselves, what standard security products do by themselves, they do. But do we do specifically DPI? No. And it's a very simple reason why not. Because when we would have to use DPI, there are certain criteria that have to be followed. And those are set for us by the College of Beschreibung Personsgegevens. And we follow them. Yeah? The reason I need to make this a bit of a, a story is that the environment at KPN is quite complex. So if you look at who actually does security at KPN, you've got uh, the chief security officer, which does physical security, and he does uh, off tapping, like tapping and monitoring based on a warrant. Um, but he's also got things like fraud management and a help desk for all security stuff. Um, then you have like the guys that do things around group risk and compliance with privacy requirements. They talk to the regulator. There's a whole legal department that does all the stuff around security, like the new cyber uh, crime legislation and what we need to do, what our obligations and requirements are there. And then we have um, the actual OPSEC part of it. So we have a NOC, we have two security operations center, and we have an abuse desk that handles customer issues. So we've got a whole bunch of stuff happening at KPN, which makes this landscape quite complex and really you can imagine we're these guys in the middle of the whole thing and what we just do is information security and business continuity so in order for us to do that in order for us to do that we've set up a new team and this team is seven months old and I, I'd like to really know if any of you have a similar thing like this um, but what we're doing is we're trying to follow the security life cycle so we're trying to do the prevention, detection, and response, but then in our team. And the detection is a bit weird because it, it hangs together with the OPSEC teams. So I have a CIO who I report to. I'm the CISO. Uh, we have a program co coordinator to help me manage this and all the stuff we have to build in the long term, which is quite a bit. And what we have is we have one team does the, that, that does the please don't fuck up request through a security policy. So their job is to write the security policies that say throughout the organization, please don't fuck up, so do the following. Yeah? Do, uh, okay, so not if this is sounding familiar. Um, and then we have a red team, which is our ethical hacking team, and what they do is they, you know, you, you have the reactive response where you have it at a, um, a security operations center that's looking for reactive detection, and then you have proactive detection. So we go and we hunt, and we're hunting for those vulnerabilities, which means that all of our products and services, before they go live, we want to test them. We want to hack them ourselves before we get hacked. And that's the idea that I think will actually help us get better at being able to provide secure services for our customers. So uh, we do internal ethical stress testing, product review, uh, application testing, audit criteria, because our audit team is a significant player here, and basically they're always right. Do you guys have to work with audit teams departments? Yeah? No? All right, well, but if you do, you'll know that no matter what it is that an audit team says, they're always right. So what we have to do is make sure that the company that we're working for doesn't come up as they're static, as lacking when we do any kind of testing and that audit doesn't come back and say, right, you've done this, but wanky. Okay. I don't know why I'm having so many technical difficulties today. I don't know. But um, so, so that's basically in the red team. We just want to be ahead. And we don't have to be miles ahead. Just a couple of, couple of steps will do. So basically, if you imagine, we have two stress points. And the stress points are the internal audit teams as well as the external hackers. So we have two different areas where we have validation points for ourselves. And then we have a CERT. We have a really quite cool CERT team, which has computer emergency response, and they work really well with both national, regional, and international teams to make sure that our CERT capability and our response capability is up to par with um, other CERT teams in the world. I thought I needed that, right? And then I thought, if I do this, I'm done. If I get like 30 some odd guys 
to help me do this. KPN, you're done. But I was wrong. I don't need just this. In order for me to get a company of 20,000 people up to scratch to do the things that we want them to do, what I really need is this thing, which is significantly more complex. It's a lot of people. So we have all these segments. All these things are different business units. I basically need to have, for lack of a better word, tentacles throughout all of these segments. I need to make sure that we have a clue there what's happening. Because if we sit in splendid isolation, we won't know shit, and we can't do shit if we find out about it. So I need to have our guys on the ground capable of responding. So we gave them little rules of stuff that they could do. So they're going to help us actually implement that policy. They're going to help us set up design principles for security and continuity, supplier management, because if we've got lots of third party suppliers. And I don't know anyone that actually patrols and relates and sees what they're doing and actually enforces that right to audit that we have. And then finally, um, incident response and risk. If you guys are working in big companies, maybe you also share the difficulty of like 3 o'clock in the morning being on a call, trying to find a device, having no idea where it is, and having no idea how to get to it, and trying to figure out what the hell that damn thing does, and how you're actually going to fix it to be doing something meaningful in a short amount of time to respond to a potential issue. And finally, incident response to risk intelligence is really the thing that I think, you know, we can't prevent everything. So we know that stuff is going to get through the gaps. And that team, when they're saying, like, bloody hell, please don't fuck up. And then that red team is saying, aha, you fucked up. That CERT team has to say, oh, you fucked up, but now I've got to fix it. They need hands to go and fix. So they need help to fix it. And the only way that we can get them that help is to get them this. OK. so. I'm not going to bore you too much with this slide, but basically what I want to say is that we have lots of stuff that happens. We have projects. We've got like this risk management cycle. We come up with those policies. We've got to do governance on those policies, but we also have to see what's going on in projects across the company. Yeah? So it's not a static, I issue a piece of paper or a manual that's this thick, and then I hope that they'll follow it and they go and run and do their merry thing. I need to make sure that every time they innovate or they have a new project to build something new, that we know what they're doing and that we can actually impact that and we can actually change it and we can, in the early phases of that project, before it goes out of control and it gets too expensive to fix. So. The way that we want to do it, we want to be able to set the architecture policies and guidelines. So to be there in the initial planning stages, we want to get budget. So we want to move stuff when they're actually building. So to determine how it actually gets done. And then have uh, security aspects in every single toll gate so that we do ethical hacking, we do pen testing, we do review, we make sure that the third party uh, guys are also under review. And then we also make sure that our security teams, which you saw in the previous slide, actually are enabled in the run phase to fix things that they see in production. So when they're actually running and going on, stuff that might have been missing the, the thing, you know, it's, it's, that leaked through the first part doesn't leak through the actual run part. So that's the goal there. And finally, and this is a new thing, we get to affect and impact bonuses of top management. So how many of you guys have a, a way to control your top management so that if security is a problem, that you can stop your managers from getting their bonus? Anybody? So your CEO. Oh. Is this better? Oh. Sorry, guys. So um, what we want to do is basically say that you're, you won't get paid your full bonus if you have not helped solve security issues or actually caused one, which I think is, is still quite new. Does anyone else have anything remotely like that? No? I, I want a reality check every now and then. Um, the thing that I've told top management, oh, God, sorry. The thing that I've told top management is that we want a joined up approach. So even though we have all these segments, we want security to go seamlessly through all those segments to make it one single path across the entity. So when departments depend on each other, it shouldn't be that stuff falls through the cracks so that we have a joined up approach all across the way and that they're supported by the senior management. And 
the same thing for when we do prerequisites for um, key strategy and implementation projects, that we have them involved in you know, awareness activities, that they're going to be there at the strategic meetings, that they come with their little face and go, yes, I support this. Thank you, CISO, that kind of stuff. Um, and that they like come to our SOC and do a visit, that they actually have an idea about what we're doing, and they're involved, and they approve, and they give us money to do more stuff. If you don't get this stuff in place, you can't basically promote the stuff you're currently doing, but you also can't build on it. Um, one thing they always ask is, okay, so I'll do everything you said. I'll reorganize my organization. You'll get to have security people in the segments. You'll get to have control over a security project budget. You'll get to be able to do all this stuff. But tell me then, when will I be secure? Like, at what point in time am I now considered secure? How many of you guys get that question? All right. That question is never possible to answer. So the only real answer is, you're never going to be secure, ever. So it's a journey, and you're going to keep on the journey, and your best hope is to be one station ahead of the guys that are behind you, both internally and externally. That's it. And forget being ahead. Sometimes you're going to fall behind, you're going to have delays, there's going to be issues. But it's a journey and not a destination. So you're never going to get there. And if you have that realization, then you need to do the following things. You need to make sure that you can build this continuous improvement. Yeah. So never think you're going to be OK, but make sure that you keep building in new ways to get better. Develop an awareness plan once, but then keep doing it. So it's not good enough today to develop some sort of like kosher awareness. Everyone has these wonderful ideas and spends lots of budget on, you know, like those trainings that everyone has to mandatory do and stuff. I don't believe in them. I just, I don't. And I, I don't think that there's one kind of panacea to solve the issue. So if you're going to do it, you have to keep doing it forever and ever and ever. So uh, there's got to be a smarter way to do this. And then finally, make sure that you can't find what you're not looking for, right? We all agree with that? So make sure that the stuff you're looking for gets changed, that you keep changing your filters, your uh, IDS filters, your monitoring requirements at your network, your logging places, the instances of where you log, what you log, how you look, where you do analysis, whether you have external review of your own pen testing activities, but make sure you shake it up. Don't do the same thing and don't keep doing the same thing. So, um, and that, that's a fundamental part of that capability. So if you develop the capability, you've got to keep improving it. So if you have security people and if you guys are managers in the room, keep investing in your people. You know, if time is tough and you have to choose between a new IDS system or sending them to a conference like this, send them to a conference like this. So one thing about, yeah, sorry? I don't know, how many people do we send all together? One, two, three, four, five. Folkert was here on a pass, nine? No, well, 20,000 don't work for me, sir. 20, yeah, what, are you from Vodafone? Where, what? You're wearing the red shirt. You're asking me grumpy questions. I'm just joking, I like the Vodafone guys. I don't know, I wasn't there. I wish, I don't think they're lagging. I, and I think it's unfair to say that they're lagging. I think you don't know you have a weakness unless it gets hurt. And I think they were doing their best with the resources they had. You know, here's the deal. And, I'm, this is now completely veering off my talk, and I'm going to get on my little soapbox. So forgive me, because the expression of the opinions that I'm expressing are my own. So I'm not KPNC. So, so I believe the following. We trust hardware and software vendors to give us stuff. We all do. Everyone in the room does. A commercial company that's there has to trust the guys that are giving them stuff to give them, the, the, the country, a service. With a, with a certain degree of requirements. So when that is the case, I think it's quite evil to hold 
the company that's delivering the service responsible for potential weaknesses or vulnerabilities that may exist in hardware and software products. I think if we're really serious about security, don't bust my balls at KPN, but take a look at hardware and software manufacturers and get them to do their job straight, because we just buy the shit. Hey, I like those boys too. Yeah, but I wasn't there. I have no idea. Dude. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know, but, you know, talk to some other guys at KPN, but what I'm trying to say is what I see now of their management, what I've seen since the last year, they are really trying. They are really got it, and they're trying, and they're trying to do their best. Oh, the last thing I wanted to say, after that capability point, I think reality checks are healthy. So I think it's really, really healthy to challenge yourself. So I, to be honest, I don't mind your questions. I think, it's, I think it's normal and healthy to make sure that you assess yourself, make sure you've gotten it right. So you have to ask the difficult questions. You have to sometimes say your baby is ugly. Never easy. Never easy to tell somebody that, right? I mean, have you ever seen like an ugly baby and be like, oh, can't say anything? But you, you sometimes have to take those, those difficult things. You've got to talk about it. You have to be open and you have to be able to have a good response. Otherwise, you should do something else, right? So I believe that this kind of formula at least kind of gets you up to par. One of the, so the first part was about attitude. It's about beliefs. It's about how we think the world should change. Great. But so what we've actually done in the last 10 months, part of that problem that I was telling you about, right? Don't fuck up. That problem is a generic problem we have across the industry. Because the minute you tell people how not to fuck up, the minute you've written a security policy document, it's old. Stuff changes. So that means your document has to be alive. It also has to be detailed, because you need to be able to tell the guys that are actually building the stuff what kind of key length do you want? Which hashing algorithm are you going to use? Uh, what's your preference for which version of what? You know, you really have to be quite specific for it to be usable. But the minute that you're specific, that document is useless. Yeah? So you've got to keep improving on your ability to do this if you want to tell people appropriately and carefully how not to fuck up. Yeah? Agreed? Okay. So we're building a new one of those. One of the things that we did since January of this year, because that awareness thing, we usually, like most companies, all the companies I've ever worked for, um, get awareness programs by the following. When you join the company or at some point in your lifetime in the company, you've got to complete 10 courses, mandatory. If you don't complete those courses, your boss is getting an email and he's going to say, why did you com not complete the introduction to electrostatic discharge? You know, some sort of nonsense bullshit like that. So. Although electrostatic discharge, not nonsense bullshit, we should all complete it. <laughs> Everybody needs to complete those, you know, clean room and all that. So, um, so, but you do get those mails, right? We all get those mails. So the point is that um, that maybe is not the best way to do it, to just have to do those mandatory trainings that are about electrostatic discharge. I think there might be a, a more living way to make security relevant and come alive for an organization. And I think the more relevant way is to invite fun people who we like, who know security, but can also explain it to a big organization of product people and marketeers and call agents. And those people, so every month we invite um, a guest hacker. We call it a guest hacker at KPN. So it's a guest hacker program. And we invite a guest hacker. And you, you got to understand, like, this is like unreal. Hackers were the enemy, you know? So we have installed a guest hacker program as of January, and we're inviting, like, January started with Tool. Tool came over to explain how uh, physical security could be defeated and compromised, and how you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket when it comes to that, and how important it is, because, I mean, that's how we secure our data centers. So, and we get quite a big turnout. You can't see it from this picture. This, by the way, this figure standing up is Miko Hipanen. He was just there recently. He's great to drink a beer with, and he's got this really cool ring uh, presenter thing, so if you ever want to get me a present, it's that ring. 
just. So 40 bucks, just Google it. Um, so yeah, it's, I'm cheap. It's, it's for, so anyway, the point is that, that we do that, and it's a huge success for an organization, a guest hacker program. And th that's my boss's boss, yeah? So he's the managing director of the Netherlands. So every entity in the Netherlands does this dude, yeah? Um, his name is Joost Farberg. And we started a weekly risk intel from last year. So every week, the guys make a risk intelligence report. Because one of the first things he tells, told me when, we, when I joined the company was like how hard it is for him to actually know what's really at the detailed level going on. You know, change the area where that risk acceptance happens so that it happens at senior management. Senior management is totally committed. But in order for them to actually have that commitment and do something about it, they also have to have a clue about what's going on in the company. So we give it, we give it no holes barred, we tell the unvarnished truth, and we do it in two sections, a classified section and an unclassified section. Classified section is for his eyes only, unclassified goes through the entire company. It's weekly. It's five items, classified, unclassified. Initially, we were doing it in an MP3, so he could listen to it on his iPhone on his car ride home every Friday. I thought that was neat, but he never used it, so he was just reading it all the time, so fine. So now we do this. But if you guys want to do it in your own company, MP3s, because it's great, and you know, CEOs, they love gadgets. Little clicky, pointy things. iPads, there you go. So, um, and one of the other things that we did is we have a very cool security operations center. Woohoo! So uh, we have a very cool security operations center. We have two of them, actually, because we thought they were so cool, but, you know, two. So, yeah, so we have an internal one and an external one. And what we did is we defined the growth path for the internal uh, stock. Um, and in terms, of, it's not just the growth path in terms of technical capability. It's also a reach in the organization. Like, how many parts of your network can you look at? How, where can you look? Where, what do you look for? So it's to expand that reach, that global reach in your organization and to have technical capability. So it's on two tracks. So if you imagine it's happening on two axes and in order for that internal SOC and external SOC to be able to work together, we made a set of SOC principles. And it's basically to make sure that we get to do all the fun things we want to do, like comprehensive intelligence, etc. The other cool thing we did is we worked with the community to do responsible disclosure. And I'm super proud of that because our guys, they, they support this. We've had a number of them actually be really successful. And here's a picture of our guys talking at Hack in the Box. And we were there as well. And to thank them, we gave them a t-shirt uh, which said, I hacked KPN and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. And they were totally happy. But we, but we worked with them from the beginning of the process. So when they found the hacks on our modems, they came to us. They talked to us. We were not scary. We did not want to prosecute. We just wanted to know, what did you find? How did you do it? Cool. All right. So um, what do you suggest? And we worked with them to go fix it and to make it better and to improve the situation. And they're happy. We're happy. They publish. We support. Yeah? And that should be how it always goes. So, who likes a video? Yay! Okay, all right. Wait, wait. Why is it not working? Uh, I'm trying to. On the thing? Okay. Yeah. There we go. Sound is good. Sound? Dus actief op zoek naar lekken in diensten van KPN zodat wij weer in staat worden gesteld om diensten te verbeteren en klanten dus veiliger kunnen internetten. Oké, okay, dus het is begonnen met dat we een fout hebben gevonden in een modem. En uh, we kwamen op een gegeven moment uh, tot een ontdekking dat we iets konden met dit modem waarvan we wisten dat dit, uh, dat dit niet iets is wat je normaal gesproken zou moeten kunnen doen met zo'n ding. Normaal gesproken dan kan je natuurlijk alleen het modem benaderen, maar nu zit je in het modem. En vanaf het modem kan je ook weer andere computers in het netwerk uh, toegang tot krijgen. Of printers op scannen. En wij dachten op dat moment, oké, okay, dit is best wel serieus. Het is een, uh, een ernstige fout die hierin zit. En er kan ook ernstig misbruik van gemaakt worden. Vervolgens hebben we uitgezocht wat de bug precies in, inhoudt. En zijn we gaan kijken waar de fout, fout precies lag. En we zijn met KPN in contact gekomen. Uh, in ons geval is dat een onschuldig motief. Maar 
Je kan natuurlijk ook een kwaad willem advies hebben. Ja, wat zijn eigenlijk nou de gevaren van een hek? Hè? Wat, wat, wat kan er nou gebeuren? Ik, stel je bent een, een dienstverlener als KPN en uh, al je abonnees kunnen twee dagen lang geen gebruik maken van internet. En dat is ten eerste een enorme imagoschade. Maar ten tweede heel vervelend voor iedereen die gewoon wil internet, want dat, dat moet gewoon werken. Dus we waren toch wel bang van ja, het is KPN, het is een groot bedrijf. Misschien begrijpen ze niet helemaal wat onze boodschap is en hoe wij, hoe wij hun willen helpen, zeg maar. Misschien zien ze ons als kwaadwillende of denken ze dat wij hun willen afpersen. Je ziet dus ook vaak in het nieuws dat mensen een bug melden uh, en dat ze vervolgens toch opgepakt worden. Omdat ze uh, ja, of te ver zijn gegaan met het, het testen van de bug of toch daadwerkelijk informatie uh, hebben opgevraagd wat ze niet hadden hoeven doen om de bug aan te tonen. Netjes in een gecrypte mail kregen we de vraag, stel dat wij iets gevonden hebben, wat gaan jullie dan doen? Gaan jullie, gaan jullie naar de politie? Maar ja, dat bleek dus helemaal niet zo het geval te zijn. Um, KPN die stond echt um, ja, open voor onze feedback en uh, ja, wij voor die van hun natuurlijk. En uh, nou, zo zijn we samen uh, tot een oplossing gekomen. Wat in deze situatie bijzonder is, is dat er voordat er contact is gezocht, heel grondig gedocumenteerd is wat het probleem is en wat ze uh, precies hebben gedaan om het probleem te ontdekken, uh, wat ons in staat stelde om echt het te reproduceren. Er is natuurlijk ook een stukje verantwoordelijkheid wat vanaf twee kanten komt. Uh, KPN als, als entiteit zijnde moet uh, hun netwerk garanderen en beschermen en professioneel zijn. En uh, ja, vanaf onze kant, wij moeten ons ook gewoon een beetje inhouden als we zoiets vinden. Uh, hebben we dan deze bugs gevonden en wij zouden bijvoorbeeld uh, daar maar al aan de haal op zijn kunnen geweest en al die modems in Nederland hebben overgenomen. Als KPN zelf uh, zijn we actief op zoek naar beveiligingsproblemen in ons netwerk. En het leuke is dat we nu van buitenaf uh, ook aanwijzingen krijgen over problemen in het netwerk. Door nou, wat we noemen de modemhackers in dit geval. Wij hadden heel erg massa dat we met KPN in aanraking kwamen. Want... KPN heeft een eigen cert team die zich specialiseert in security. En we trekken daarin samen op, dus we doen vergelijkbaar soort werk. Vervolgens is de oplossing geïmplementeerd, zijn wij nog een aantal keer teruggekomen om de implementatie te verifiëren. En nadat dat deze geverifieerd was, hebben we, heeft KPN de oplossing uitgerold bij de modems van haar klanten. KPN omarmt de ethical hackers eigenlijk. Hè? Dus, uh... We zijn uh, heel blij met, uh, met ons werk en uh, ja, wij zijn heel blij met hun samenwerking. Ja, ik denk dat we op de goede weg zijn, of uh, KPN in ieder geval. Dank. Hey, so that was a, a thing. So I actually combined two things with the same like video thingy. So we took them into our responsible disclosure uh, process and then we invited them to talk at the guest hacker program. So that's an example also of the guest hacker program. That's all we do. We just talk to guys who are in the community, who are in the field, and you know, it's not just the Miko Hipanins of the world, it's also just the regular guys who interact with us and talk to us. So the only thing I want to say about the guest hacker program is it's just a way for people to come talk to us. That's it. And we really, that's, that's it's not, too much more complex than that. So if you found something, or if you think you found something, or you just think we're evil, whatever it is you think, come talk to us and let us work with you. That, that's all the uh, request is. Um, that was an example before of how we work within the community. This is an example of how we work with the authorities. And um, have you guys heard of Operation Cyberpaint? Yeah, so for those of you who haven't heard of Operation Cyberpaint, um, it's basically um, a paintball competition. I know you've heard of it. You didn't put your hand up, naughty person. But um, she, she, the girl who did not put her hand up made the shirt that said, uh, women in cybersecurity, we paint your balls. <laughs> I thought that was awesome. That was so cool, Iva. So um, anyway, the point is that Cyberpaint was a way for hackers and the authorities to basically fight it out with each other, you know, to stop the disagreements they had on Twitter and to basically get in on it during a paintball session. So they just paintballed each other. And I can tell you, those little, I couldn't say that word, but it was a really bad word that I was going to say. They hurt. They really, really hurt, those little paintballs. It was really, ow. So uh, very effective. And we also cooperate with the authorities in just such a manner. You know, we cooperate with them regularly, intensively. We talk to all of our uh, people who try to help us because ultimately I think we all have the same goal. We all want to protect the people that use the services of KPN. That's it. The authorities want the same thing as we do. We just want to make sure that there's a free, fair, and 
fun internet that everyone has a right to use and play with. Um, oh, Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention one thing. So the guys that uh, created CyberPaint and run it, they, they didn't at the time, but now they both work for our team. So I'm holding it up as something we do when, in fact, when in fact it wasn't something that we did, but we thought they were such cool guys that we um, uh, asked them to do this. Let me just press play. There's another little two-minute video. Anonymous, ethische hackers, het cybercorps van de politie en andere beveiligingsexperts. In de digitale wereld zijn het vaak elkaars vijanden en hebben ze nauwelijks contact. Dus was het tijd voor een ontmoeting in real life, vond een van hen. En dat gebeurde op een paintballbaan. Gelukkig ben ik iedereen nu al kwijt. Vandaag hier geen dedels aanvallen, maar gewoon aanvallen met verfballetjes. En dat is echt niet alleen omdat het gewoon heel erg leuk is. Oh. We proberen vandaag iedereen uit, uh, uit allerlei facetten van, uh, van internet security bij elkaar te brengen. Ik hou een beetje met de bestrijding van cybercrime. Ik ben hacker in mijn werk en in mijn vrije tijd. Het call hacker binnen KPN. Ik ben een uh, hacker. Ik behoor tot de mensen die de beveiliging proberen te regelen. We proberen dus uiteindelijk in, in een gelijkwaardig speelveld iedereen tegenover elkaar te zetten. Met elkaars ideeën, idealen, achtergronden en dat soort dingen. En lekker proberen uit te vechten en uh, fysiek de argumenten aan te laten komen. So the guy Operation that you just saw talking is in tent two. He's dus also giving a talk right now, and he now works for KPN. Volgens de organisatie praten de verschillende groepen te weinig echt met elkaar en zitten ze vooral op eigen fora. En dat zonde. Binnen het IT security veld heeft iedereen goede bedoelingen en we kunnen op een sportieve manier kennis met elkaar maken en van gedachten wisselen. En het is goed om uh, de partij bij elkaar te brengen op deze manier. Nou, volgens mij is het heel uniek. Ik heb nog nooit van iets, zoiets gehoord uh, dat al deze geledingen bij elkaar komen om elkaar eens uh, nou ja, te beargumenteren met paintballs in plaats van met woorden of uh, computerprotocolletjes. Maar er werd niet alleen met verf geschoten. Daar gaat het vrij even. Moet je terughekken wel of niet toestaan? To dedels or not to dedels? Het kwam in een paneldiscussie allemaal aan bod. De dialoog tussen de verschillende partijen was er dus zeker. Al draaide deze dag toch vooral om één ding. Volgens mij moet je gaan, uh, gaan paintballen. Ik ben wel eens weer aan de beurt, geloof ik. Wie wil je gaan raken? Uh, iedereen. Succes. <laughs> Dank je. Dat was het voor nu. Note. Je hoort ons elke dag. So, on that note, this is, you know, I think one of the fun ways how we cooperate with the authorities. I, I, I don't think I have that many. Great. Okay. So, um, remember what I said? I think it's really healthy to get reality checks. How much time do I have left? Oh, okay. Um, so, we benchmark with other telcos through the ATIS forum. We do, uh, with other ethical hackers, we try to sharpen our skills. You know, we're not there yet. We're building a team. The team is seven months old. But in the first round, they placed in fourth place. In the second round, they placed in first place, defeating the world champion, at least for that round. And uh, they're off to the third round, so we'll see how they do. You know, it's a small team. And everybody in the team, close your ears. But, you know, maybe they don't win. But they, for me, have heard they have to win, just to kind of prove, you know, you're here, so show me the stuff. But it's, I think it's good to set some aggressive goals. So the first team has to you know, finish the security policies. The second team, the ethical hackers, they've got to win the Cyber Olympics. And that third team, that third team for me, has to write an annual report about the state of security and the incidents that we see from KPN. So they've all got aggressive goals for this year in order to do, but they've got some time. The final reality check is, what we do is not KPIs, but KSIs, key security indicators. And I think there's a lot of ways to have, again, a healthy reality check. Like, am I doing the right things? Am I really doing what I promised? And is it actually deal leading to any form of better security? You know, because we all do stuff every day, but does it actually work? Does it actually make us more secure, less resistant, uh, or more resistant for fraud and make us, our customers happier? And I think that that's got to be things that we can test. So under all those things that we've talked about before, I've got a whole set of criteria. I'm not going to go through them now, but the thing will be available. So if you ever get really, really bored, you could see the presentation. Um, but for all of those things, I think it's really important for security organizations to really be quite brutally honest with themselves and see if they are doing those things. I didn't want to stop the presentation without doing this, so I'm just going to quite quickly tell you what I really worry about. So for the next six months, what I think that we should all be keeping an eye on, and me specifically, are the following. The expansion of opportunistic hacks. So really, it's about examining that perimeter and knowing, making sure that it is intact. 
And I think for us that presents a significant problem simply because the perimeter is so large. It's an extensive set of addresses and networks and services and products to manage. And you have to tie them all back to each other in some rational way and make sure that you're looking for the goods. Yeah? So that's quite difficult. DDoSes. Nothing really new, but I don't think we've seen the last of it. So I think the increase in DDoS and the lack of really, you know, foolproof anti-DDoS, because anti-DDoS is like travel insurance, you know? You don't always need it, but you need to kind of have it, and when you need it, it better work, right? So these kinds of things are really difficult to get right, and we see it happening and failing in multiple places. So I'm really quite uh, sat scared about this kind of stuff. Um, cloud migration and data attacks. We're basically creating lots of very interesting honeypots. Some of them are, are global and transregional, and other ones are just n national. But in any case, lots of areas where you consolidate all kinds of interesting traffic without necessarily looking for the security issues that could happen on them just present problems. Um, New attacks through old techniques. If you heard my colleagues talk on uh, the LTE stuff, what you're really hearing is that attacks that we already know about are happening on new technologies. I think we're going to see the same thing. And right now, what we know about IPv6, a lot of the stuff we already knew during IPv4. So, you know, we're talking about flooding of the um, IPv6, uh, whatchamacallit agent that actually gives you your IPv6 address. So it's the same kind of, sorry? Of course, you're going to know this, Ilyich. <laughs> of course you are. So, um, and, and what my colleague also asked you to do, Rob Cathers asked you to do, is uh, help us examine this, because we also wanted to get it right. We are dependent on vendors to implement these new technologies. Yeah? Old attacks are coming back, so let's make sure that we can work them out. And we can do it with your help. Okay, mobile diversity-based attacks. You know, there's client diver device uh, diversity, but there's also, like, th there was this one company that I really had a lot of hope in. Uh, it was called 3LM. Google bought it when they bought over Motorola. Um, but, they, but they stopped it. They killed it for some reason. It was called the Three Laws of Mobility. Did anyone hear about that? It was really neat. If you're bored, check that one out, too. Three Laws of 3LM. But they were doing um, uh, different mobility uh, security on different areas. So it was going to be awesome if it ever launched. And finally, state-sponsored espionage. It's already been planted ages ago, but we're just previewing it now. And here's the deal with state-sponsored espionage. If, if I am really worried about foreign countries tapping KPN, I think that I need the help of the cooperation of the authorities to help me figure that one out. Because if they really want to tap us, they will. Right? So I don't see it as solely our responsibility to be able to prevent this. But I will more than happily work with anyone who can guarantee the privacy and the secrecy of the data that we have and we protect for our customers. Yeah? And that's where I see my responsibility. Um, I'm going to stop here. And I, I don't know if we have, like, a minute for questions. Well, uh, thank you, J.F., for your very candid and, in, and uh, inspirational and, uh, I was going to say, refreshingly candid. So we can take uh, one or two questions, but will we be at the Media Cafe afterwards? Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, we can have one or two questions right now, and then we'll uh, move over to the Media Cafe and make space for the next presenter here. So you were talking about uh, protecting the perimeter, and uh, I was wondering if, if uh, an or a, a huge organization like KPN really knows what, what is his perimeter, or are you still figuring it out like the Dutch government is still indexing all the, the, the websites and all the internet exposure they have because it's so huge? And I was wondering, do you have a clear view of, of what's really your perimeter you're protecting, or are you still infantizing? Like I said, you don't know, you, you can't look for stuff that you don't know about. So obviously, the engineers at KPN are dealing from a presumption of a certain 
uh, what's the word, a uniform basis that we do know what that perimeter is. But they're, like every other company, you know, a, a company I evolves organically and orgasmically. I don't know what the right word is here. But, but it keeps evolving, yeah, and it keeps evolving in different areas. So, of course, it's possible there are parts of the perimeter that you don't know about. But I don't think that's any different than any other large company or any other large telco or any other large network. So, yeah, it's still a worry. Okay, thank you. There's room for one more question at this time. Yeah, let's have it over here, and then uh, we'll wrap it up. Uh, you talked about uh, how you handle uh, security issues from, from outside, basically by responsible disclosure. Um, talked about lots of policy and technical security, but I know my experience with, with reporting a security incident to KPN just while you are in the process of, of handling, of, of uh, adopting a responsible disclosure program, was that I was yelled at through the phone, and um, and that's not that's it, I, I won't say it will always happen. But the the question is, how did you uh, if uh, get the this big a change in also culture in in because it's not just policy getting yelled at. I hope. <laughs> so how do you get to the change in culture that's necessary? When was this? Last year? Okay, so I'm not sure who yelled at you. I fire them. No, so, no, no, no. There, there's, it's no one from our team. So I, I apologize from all of KBN, but but the, the, our policy, our policy, yep, yeah, our policy is just to start the conversation, and it's absolutely not to yell. Um, you know, unless you did something evil, don't do evil. Just talk to us before you do evil, and let us know that it exists, and then we can take it from there. The culture. Yeah, we, that's hard. That's the hardest thing of all. But um, we're trying to make it clear that, that doing security is vital. It's necessary. It's sexy. Um, and that's, you know, everything. Like from our logo to being really normal about how we do testing, all of it. It's to show that we're not causing additional overhead, but we're actually providing value. So if you can prove the incentive every time, if it's always carrot and not so much stick, there's stick every once in a while, but they like it. Um, but that was a joke, you guys. It was like, all right. So, but if you can do that, I think that's how you change culture. Okay, thank you, uh, Jaya. Um, let's move over to the Media Cafe, make space for the next uh, program item here.